Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to all of you, including Scott Hepburn, Jeff Wilkes, Paley Glendale, and brand new patrons, Fox Free Jack and Chris. Welcome. On this episode of DTNS, why Netflix should hide its subscriber numbers. Nate Langson helps us understand why the EU might require Facebook to give away its service with lower value ads. And should we just stop calling people users? Unless they're, you know, using. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, April 19th, 2024. When in Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. When I'm at Studio Animal House, which I am, I'm Sarah Lane. Drawing to top tech stories in Cleveland, I'm Grandpa Len Peralta. And uh, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Joining us, Bloomberg's tech editor and host of the Text Message podcast, Nate Langson. Welcome. Hello. Thanks for having me back on a Friday of all days. Yes, indeed. Uh, that means uh, for Good Day Internet, uh, you get to stick around for the quiz. I'm very quiz. excited. Quiz. Quiz. Yeah. And uh, let's also welcome Len's granddaughter. Yeah. Granddaughter. Yeah. Welcome. Evie. Baby Evie. Evie Jean. Baby Evie. Ah, welcome, baby Evie. Do you feel old? Uh, I always feel old. Yes. Yeah. Do you, you, you don't feel any older than usual? Yeah. <laughs> no, okay. Never. Good. Good. Uh, well, <laughs> then let's start with the quick hits. China doesn't allow app store operators to carry certain apps that it determines violates Chinese law. For example, Facebook is inaccessible in the country. The Cyberspace Administration of China has now issued orders against several messaging apps requiring app store operators like Apple to remove WhatsApp, Telegram and Signal from their app stores over national security concerns. The order has also asked app stores to remove the Threads microblog service. I mean it took them this long to remove threads. It kind of surprises me. Uh, the U.S. bill that would force ByteDance to sell the U.S. version of TikTok or order its distributions stopped in the U.S. is gaining a second wind. That bill was previously passed in the House, but the Senate did not take it up. A second version of the bill will most likely be voted on Saturday with two changes. One, there's a longer period for ByteDance to sell it after the bill becomes law, nine months instead of six months, with an option for the president to extend it another three months. So you'll see it referred to as a 12-month uh, period. And it's now packaged in with sanctions on Iran and Russia. So you have to vote for all of it together, yes or no. Additionally, U.S. Senator Maria Cantwell has said she now fully supports the bill with these changes. She, she was skeptical before. Uh, that makes it possible it might actually get through the Commerce Committee that she chairs and possibly get full Senate approval sometime next week. If all of that happens and it passes and becomes law, ByteDance would likely challenge it on constitutional grounds, possibly get an injunction. So uh, it's not like we're going to see TikTok banned next week, but the story continues to unfold. On Tuesday, Microsoft Research Asia announced Vasa One, a diffusion model that can make a video of a person based on a single photo and synced to an audio recording of speech or singing. VASA stands for Visual Effective Skills Animator. The animation can render facial expressions, head movements, and sync lips to speech. It's similar to Alibaba's Emo, uh, Emote Portrait Alive is what Emo stands for, which can sync an animated video to an audio track as well. Microsoft's VASA One can generate videos at 512 by 512 pixel resolution at 40 frames per second, suitable for use as a video conference avatar, say. VASA One is a research demo, and Microsoft says it doesn't plan to release the model as a product or API at this time. Yeah, someday it comes to Teams, and then you can use it instead of showing your real self so you can stay in your pajamas and not put on makeup. Love but it. I think that's where we're headed with that. Possibly use it for NPCs and video games. Uh, DJI is taking its battery smarts developed for the, its quadcopters and such and putting it into power stations. The Power 500 sells for $379 and the Power 1000 for $699. And those model numbers are proxies for the watt hours. 1,024 in the Power 1000, 512 watt hours in the Power 500. They're pretty comparable to what you might see from Anchor or EcoFlow, uh, the usual selection of DC, AC, and USB ports. But the differentiator is is the proprietary bi-directional port called Smart SDC that can fast charge DJI drone batteries, uh, along with some other things like take power from solar panels. The batteries use lithium ion phosphate, or LFP, which lasts longer and is a little safer than the traditional NMC batteries. 
Meta has cut the price of the Quest 2 from $249 to $199. That is the second price cut this year. Headset started this year at $299, so we got $100 bucks off at this point. The Quest 3 continues to sell for $499, so you're not going to get the cutting edge of Meta's VR with the Quest 2, but it's still a very capable headset with 1832 by 1920 per eye and a 90Hz refresh rate. You can even access Xbox Cloud Gaming on it. And uh, that's one promise Sarah made to you at the end of GDI, that we would revisit that story with more details today. Now you can fulfill the other promise you made, talking about Netflix. Indeed. Uh, I was going to fight this tooth and nail if someone said, no, no, Sarah, I, I promised the people on Thursday we're doing it. <laughs> uh, now, this is big news today. Netflix announced its Q1 earnings report on Thursday. Overall, very positive news, uh, although the, 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 its stock took a little bit of a hit, so we'll explain. Netflix beat earnings, revenue, and subscriber estimates. Estimates. That's all good news. Subscribers rose 16% in the quarter to hit 269.6 million worldwide, well above the 164.2 million that was expected. However, Netflix is going to do something a little different a year from now when we get its Q1 2025 earnings, because whether Netflix's subscriber base shrinks or swells, the company is not going to tell us. Uh, Netflix announced at that point it will no longer report total subscriber numbers, instead focusing on engagement, time spent with the service. He calls it its best proxy for customer satisfaction. Co-CEO Ted Sarando said, quote, we're in the very early days of developing our live programming, and I would like to look at this as an expansion of the types of content we offer. So you can expect more live stunt programming like Jake Paul and Mike Tyson fighting, for example. But subscriber numbers, huge metric for any streaming services growth and scale. Netflix's subs are growing, at least for now. So why do we think the decision to hide them was made? I think Netflix is justified in this. Nate, do you agree or disagree? Uh, justified isn't the word I would necessarily use, but I do think it's interesting that a lot of investors are quite upset about about this because investors really like transparency uh, and saying you're not going to give them data that they've had for a long time is never going to go down particularly well and it, and it hasn't. Consumers obviously don't care about this, but why it's interesting is that it's really not unprecedented for very, very large tech companies. Apple's done this uh, before. I think Meta has done something similar for, for slightly different reasons. But with Netflix, two massive things are going on. One is their subscriber base is fluctuating massively, either because of things like the pandemic and then cost of living. And now we're moving into this era of cracking down on password sharing, but also adding in um, ad, you know, ad supported uh, tiers as well, which a lot of people are taking advantage of. And so I kind of feel like for Netflix, they just had to pull the button and say, look, we're going to do this because things are going to get choppy and there's going to be some volatility and we don't want people reacting to short term changes when actually they should be focusing on the big picture. So it's probably quite smart. Yeah, I'm, I'm not too far off from you uh, in that. I think it has more to do with saturation than volatility, but they're, they're both playing a part in it. So it's just a matter of, you know, which emphasis you want to give. Uh, I think Netflix is looking at subscribers and saying, well, certainly in the markets we've been in for a long time, uh, specifically the United States and Canada, uh, we are reaching saturation. We are reaching a point where you're just not you're just not going to get a whole lot more subscribers. And cracking down on password sharing was the one way we were going to be able to do it. Also, subscribers were only really an indication of here's the money we think we can get, uh, especially now that they have an ad supported service. So shifting that focus to revenue, I think is better for the investors. And it's a better sense of how the business is doing to say, we're actually making money, we're making profit. Uh, and that's what you should be focused on. As far as users go, are they engaged with the service? Well, then they're less likely to uh, cancel. And for our ad supported stuff, they're going to see more ads. So that's a better metric. Uh, subscriber numbers aren't going to be very informational. They're they're gonna they're gonna max out. They're gonna grow in markets where they still have room to grow, and then they're gonna max out. Mm -hmm. uh, that happens to every business. When you leave the customer acquisition phase, which is what st streaming is doing, it's leaving the customer acquisition phase and going into the consolidation and monetization phase. So this makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, I mean, obviously you got a finite number of users. Netflix knows this. Um, maybe there, maybe Netflix is like you know. Probably about a year from now, you know, we might see some dips or at least 
uh, slowing of subscriber growth that would, you know, people might latch onto. But with the subscribers that we have, instead of them saying, ooh, look, Netflix didn't get as many new subscribers as, as you know, uh, the forecast or what the street thought um, it would get, here's how Netflix is making more money off of the subscribers it has. I think the focus of not losing any or, you know, trying to curb that as much as possible, but then monetizing the user base that is there and apparently quite strong. I mean, what else really can Netflix do? I mean, obviously Netflix is has dabbled in certain verticals. You know, gaming is still it's still somewhat unclear, you know, what Netflix's long long term strategy is for gaming. But there's that there's live programming, there's sports. I mean, all of that stuff is relatively new for the company. And uh, if Netflix feels confident that uh, engagement hours and and monetization is the way to go, then everyone's just going to have to get used to it. And I wonder how many other companies will follow suit. This could be a trend, you know, that a lot of streaming services go like, yeah, you know what? Don't worry so much about our growth numbers. Worry about how we're monetizing the folks that we already have. Yeah. I think the, I, other, the other angle is that a lot of the other streaming companies also have other businesses that have their own subscribers, whereas Netflix is kind of all streaming or nothing. Yeah. And and they want to change that. They want to. I bet they want to spin out a gaming service. At which point they'll give subscriber numbers to that gaming service. Uh, they're going to continue to tell you how well their individual shows have done. Like, and that's normal. You you care more how Fallout did on Amazon Prime than you care how many subscribers Amazon Prime has. You certainly care more how much an HB how well an HBO show does than you care what the overall HBO numbers are. So I, I think that now applies to Netflix, which is interesting because they used to not want to give you any kind of numbers uh, about their shows. They only wanted to focus on subscribers, just a different phase of the business, I guess. Uh, let's switch over to an interesting article on the MIT Technology Review site by Taylor Majewski called, It's Time to Retire the Term User. The proliferation of AI means we need a new word. Now, I'm not sure they followed up on the second part of that, uh, the subhead, uh, as, as much as I would have liked, but uh, it is a really interesting question. The article quotes cognitive scientist Don Norman. Uh, you might know him as the author of The Design of Everyday Things, a seminal work in design, saying that designers in the 90s, when he worked at Apple, thought of users as part of the system, not as people. And Majewski posits this has created a distance between software companies and their customers and might explain some of the ways that software companies tend to abuse their customers, or at least customers feel that way. Both Norman and a Georgia Tech professor named Janet Murray have advocated against the term user, saying it's depersonalizing. Uh, Jack Dorsey changed Square from citing users to citing customers for similar reasons. And Facebook even started trying to use the word people by default instead of users starting in 2014. So what do you think, Nate? Uh, I, do you like the word user? I just don't care. I just wonder who 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 <laughs> cared about this enough in the first place. Like, who's asking not to be called a user? I just I don't understand what I mean, the benefit is. I don't here. know how much I this is not something I'm losing sleep over, but I don't like the term. I think it it it's something that we're used to when you hear the term user, you go, OK, that stands for one person. But yeah. uh, I think this is part of a greater conversation of, OK, well, is it always a person? Is it sometimes a model um, that's also part of this system, you know, and and I don't know, there's something about user that I don't find it offensive, but it's sort of like saying grabbing eyeballs um, when, you know, talking Sounds about painful. a platform or a website or whatever. It's like it's just I know what it means, but it's just it's like, I don't know, tearing us apart a little bit. And also there are lots of terms that are widely used like influencer. I hate that term. It's just, a, it's just, it's just, it's a horrible term. It, you know, or, you know, somebody saying that they're a, you know, thought leader. It's like, what? I mean, we're all thought leaders. Come on. I think I once described themselves as an ideapreneur and I never <laughs> wanted to see that person wow. again. Yeah. I'm take just, that. I just got ideas, you know, from scratch. <laughs> yeah. yeah like just making them up. But yeah, but back to vendor. user, I think it's, it, I think, I don't know. Maybe there's like a you know connotation like drug user. There's something about user that it does sort of sound like we're all in a machine, and it is a depersonalization of 
people. I, this gives me confidence that the world is not burning quite as badly as we thought. <laughs> that if this is the problem that we need to deal with, and by we, I mean apparently society and very clever people, cleverer than me, if this is the big, if this is the big problem, we're golden. Don't worry about the world. We'll be fine. Because to me, this is a non-issue. I, I wonder who came up with this as being a problem that required thought. Because I see the thought process, and I respect that there is some thought gone into this. I think the proliferation of AI that that you mentioned at the start of this section, like that makes me, that's interesting. But who is complaining? I mean, apart from Sarah, and for I get that reason, but... I don't know. I mean, I probably wouldn't have complained uh, had I not uh, realized that somebody else was thinking about it. But, yeah. you know, it goes, It you, you see this uh, all over the place. Many uh, uh, restaurants and retail stores will call you a guest rather than a customer. Um, that's something, that's not new. I mean, what it, you're it, called changes how you feel about it. And I'm, right. I, I, have, I have to say, I'm disappointed that Nate, as a journalist, isn't obsessing about word choice. Isn't that what we do as journalists? Like we, oh, we over and em Listen, emphasize the importance of words. I call people lots of things <laughs> when they're not listening. And I would say that being a user is one of the least offensive terms I could use to describe some people. Um, but that all said, I think this is, you're right about the whole guest. This is about, it's PR, essentially, it's spin, it's marketing. But I don't think that this is a problem that needs thought. And I'm just going to leave it at, at that. Uh, that all said, very interesting to debate. So if anything, it's given us a really interesting conversation that I'm glad yeah, to yeah. have had. I'm glad we I'd... used this as part of a conversation. <laughs> I, I think I might disagree with you. I think there's more... I think there's more effect to user than than we might think, uh, but you know maybe maybe somebody should do some studies and find out if my instinct is is right or not. But that's a know but, a little more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I feel, the I the, the big like question is there. okay. Let's say we all decide the user isn't good enough. Now, what's the word? I think, and that's where Majewski uh, has a really good part of the article, and I, I encourage everyone to go read it. Uh, Majewski says that what people are doing is saying, well, let's use the specific word that's appropriate. And I think that's why I'm sympathetic to the argument, which is user kind of like doesn't tell you much. Mm. But if it's a person or a customer or a, in, in the sense of games, we don't say users, we say players or we say gamers yeah, or readers. It, be it's, it becomes more useful as, as to understand, oh, that's what we're talking about versus user, which is just kind of lazy and catch all. Perfect. Mm. That's yeah. the argument. I agree with that 100%. There we go. We brought it all back around. Uh, well, folks, uh, if you would like to get five things in your head in 60 <laughs> seconds that will make you smarter, uh, watch our top five show at youtube.com slash daily tech news show. This week's episode, I count down the top five pop stars who have recorded video game music. These are names you know. Uh, in most cases, Roger Chang did the legwork and, and looked them up, uh, and I count them down. You can catch it at Daily Tech News Show on TikTok, at DTNS Picks on Instagram, and of course, like I said, youtube.com slash Daily Tech News Show. In Europe, Meta is required to get informed and freely given user consent before tracking them for advertising purposes. Meta cannot charge as much for ads, though, if they're not closely targeted and is concerned that if most people don't give consent, it won't make enough money to justify running its businesses like Facebook and Instagram. Its solution? Let folks either agree to tracking or pay for the service or just don't use it. The European Data Protection Board said Wednesday that if a controller of a service, like Meta, wants to opt to charge a fee for access to the equivalent alternative, they should give significant consideration to offering an additional alternative. This free alternative should be without behavioral advertising. The recommendation, not legally binding, just a recommendation. Before we get into our discussion, which we're about to have, Patrick Beja wanted to comment on the story and sent us this message. Hey, Tom and crew, I wanted to weigh in on this uh, conversation. I think a lot of people are going to focus on whether or not the government should be allowed to dictate uh, the terms of business in the way that it seems to be doing with that decision, which I think is a fair question. It might be a little bit one-sided uh, because a lot of Americans usually take, play, take part in those conversations on most of those shows, which is why I'm really happy Nate is on the show today, right? He's there. Go, Nate. But there's another uh, question that this decision uh, asks which is super interesting as well. And that is the question of, can 
a web business model that is based on advertising work if you don't have access to as much personal data? I think we're all a little bit uncomfortable with what has become uh, the surveillance capitalism model. And I think all of us are like, yeah, it's really cool, but it, it, it's a bit weird that we have to give away, give up all of our uh, personal data for those giant mega corporations that make dozens of billions of dollars uh, of profit a quarter. And maybe there's a middle way with regular, quote unquote, advertising being inserted in the mix. And those companies are never going to go that way by themselves. They don't want to because, of course, it's going to make probably less billions of dollars of profit. And maybe that decision is going to nudge some of them, at least in that way. And we can find out if it can work or not. Maybe it can't. But it's an interesting question, which I don't think we should just throw away because, oh, big government and that's bad. All right. See you. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. Uh, nice to hear your voice. So, Nate, what is your take on on Patrick's take and 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 the story in general? Well, I I mean, I do agree with everything Patrick just said. I think he put it very eloquently. So I'll I'll pick a, a slightly different uh, angle, which is that there are campaign groups and some very notable campaigners out there who are very are vehement in their suggestion that Meta should not be charging. Uh, a fee for users to use their products and not be tracked or that the amount that they are charging is too much or it should be very, very little. And I remember when this was discussed actually in DTNS a few a few days ago, maybe even a couple of weeks ago, and I was out walking the dog and I remember out loud actually shouting, well, don't use it then. And when Roger asked me, what do you want to talk about on the show this week? I thought back to that dog walk because I thought if this is such an issue is Meta, as a collection of companies, is it so vital that not using it is not an actual viable option? Because I don't believe that it is that essential that users have to be able to use it without being tracked and not pay for it or or not at all. It's not like an ISP or a phone company or, or your electricity provider. It doesn't have a monopoly in the way that we think of social media companies maybe in the past having had a monopoly. And then as a final extension to that thought, my wife the other day was talking to me about magnets for reasons I won't bore you with, but it was <laughs> actually a fascinating reason. And mentioned the word magnets several times, magnets, magnets, magnets. And then the very next day got an ad on Instagram for magnets and was absolutely inconsolable that her phone was listening to her and this is the thing and I said it isn't listening to you and we had a whole conversation about that and my thought was well if you don't like the ads just don't use it but she needs it for work as well and it brought it all back to that mm. conversation that I screamed out loud in the woods on my own looking like a crazy person with my dogs um, about <laughs> not using it because if is there really this choice is there a, or, or do we need to have to use these products? And if so, do the vehemently angry campaigners have a point that actually a, uh, a reasonable alternative without tracking shouldn't either cost anything or cost very much? I don't know. But they were the thoughts that I wanted to bring to you today. I liked uh, I like Patrick's uh, instinct to focus this away from the usual like, well, is it government's role to say this or not? Because I think we can all imagine how that conversation is going to go depending on what your ideology is. Right. Uh, and so I think it is interesting for him to say, but if they prevail and again, this is just an advisory opinion. It's not the actual enforceable opinion yet. Uh, so we're not there yet. But if they said no, uh, Facebook, you ha you can't do that. You can't make it. You either pay or get tracked. Uh, you know, and Facebook decides to continue to make its business available without tracking for free, what does that do? We would be able to find out. It would be interesting to find out how much does that actually impact the bottom line? Maybe it doesn't impact it as, as much as Meta is worried about. Uh, on the other hand, Meta might not make that decision. Meta, I, tell me if I'm wrong, would be within its rights under EU law to say, well, then fine. Instagram and Facebook are only available as a subscription that you pay for yes. in the European Union. Uh, and and that then we won't make a free version available. I think that's as interesting as Patrick's question, which is, OK, if 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 you force them to say, well, you you can't have a free version uh, that has tracked ads only, uh, would they, would, you know, would you call their bluff and they're like, okay, fine, we'll still make some money or would they just yank it? 
I think for the size of the market and the number of users Meta has here, I think yanking it out of the market is not uh, is not going to happen. But as we saw with things like Threads not launching in the EU for quite a long time because of concerns over compliance with relatively new laws, um, Facebook does have the power to say to a large number of people, we're not going to give you a product because it's just not compatible with our business model and our setup at this time. So I do think it's it's possible. I don't think anything should be forced. And I say that as neither a Facebook user nor as someone who particularly hates any company at all. But I, I do think that there's a, a degree of choice left here for the mm -hmm. user in that choice is don't use it. If you don't want, if you don't like it, don't use it. I wouldn't be shocked if Meta decides to do something else, which is, okay, fine. We'll have a free version that doesn't track you with less functionality. Mm -hmm. with the, there will move a bunch of features into the paid version. And then we go to court all over again with somebody like, no, now, now you're giving a, a, a less quality version if you're not tracked. And it just starts the argument all over again. Yeah. Well, Let's check out the mailbag. No That'll arguing in the mailbag today. Um, <laughs> this is actually kind of fun. Yesterday, uh, Rob and I were talking to Dr. Nikki Ackermans about AI training, other AI. And Rob was chuckling about how back in the day, if you kept taking a photocopy of a photocopy, you would see the quality degrade a little yep. more each time. Josh wrote in and said, obscure reference for the conversation about photocopies of photocopies. In the movie Multiplicity with Michael Keaton, the plot is how cloning a clone made the next clone keep getting dumber and they use the metaphor of a photocopy of a photocopy. Josh, I was trying to remember that yesterday and I couldn't uh, in that moment. Multiplicity, very funny movie. And Adnan also wrote in and said, you reminded me of a Rick and Morty episode with the decoys making their own decoys who then make their own decoys, et cetera, et cetera, but they don't know their decoys. One of my favorite episodes. Indeed. Uh, good good uh, cultural uh, memory there in the DTNS audience. Yeah. Uh, and then real quickly, uh, Dean wrote in in response to our discussion of water companies in the United States coming under uh, cyber attacks. Uh, saying one of the biggest issues is that many water companies are tiny, especially ones that serve small populations. There can be just one or two people managing the whole thing. Another issue is funding. Your tax money will normally go first to infrastructure versus securing the SCADA or DCS systems. Forcing a layer of regulation on top of this would be a burden to an already struggling industry. Not saying there shouldn't be something done, but like everything, <laughs> it is complicated. CISA does their best, but they are also underfunded and under-resourced. One company that is trying to help is Drago, offering community watch services for free to smaller utilities. Thank you, Dean, uh, for sending along that information. And thank you, Len Peralta, for illustrating today's show. What have you been drawing? Len Peralta, are you there? He seems frozen in bliss I'm... over being a grandpa. Sadly, <laughs> uh, we do know what he what he drew, even if his uh, video feed is, is frozen. So you can find this at patreon.com slash Len or just buy it on its own at lenperaltastore.com. Uh, it says A is for abandonment. Uh, and I was going to describe it more, but it went away. Oh, there we go. Uh, Netflix. Uh, what does it say? Netflix decides, decides to, hide to hide their number, their of, number subscribers. of subscribers. MIT Technology Review wants to retire the term user. Uh, poor, poor Netflix subscriber number and users just being abandoned. And <laughs> I, I believe this is a tribute to children's books uh, in honor of Len's new granddaughter. So that's very sweet. Thank you, Len. Uh, and once again, if you are a subscriber to his Patreon at the DTNS lover level, you can get that automatically, patreon.com slash Len, uh, or just buy it. Uh, and you can buy other things and commission Len at lenperaltastore.com. Thank you, Len, as always. And thanks to you, Nate Langson. Good to see you again on this here show. Let folks know where they can keep up with everything you do. Well, I do a lot of behind the scenes work these days for Bloomberg Originals. So if you are in the market for regular and very high quality documentaries about news and current events uh do check that out and you'll find that on youtube that's the best place really uh bloomberg original stuff some very good stuff there if i say so myself 
Indeed. All right, patrons, you know what it is. Friday, time to stick around for the extended show's fun time. It's a quiz. Roger has put together a quiz to test everyone's knowledge of Meta. See if you're up to date on all of Meta and Facebook's efforts. Stick around for that. Just a reminder, we record DTNS Live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. We'd love to have you join us live if you can. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We hope you have a great weekend. We're back on Monday with Justin Robert Young joining us. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and co-host, Rob Dunwood. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Technical producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. Our science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese. Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Tom McNeil. Contributors for this week's shows include Nika Monford and Scott Johnson. Our guest this week was Nate Langson. And thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>